This evening we'll be looking at Nehemiah chapter 3. Just a few weeks ago, one of our guest speakers for a week emphasis on missions, David Meredith, preached from this exact text, and he did an excellent job of exploring the, the power of partnering, and this passage clearly shows what that can do. Also, as Pastor Tom Grolsema mentioned, he laid a great foundation for the book as a whole. Uh, plus, David has a really cool accent. On top of it all, he found ways to weave uh, rock songs into his sermon and other references to pop culture. But rather than just pointing you to that sermon, um, in the words of Ray Charles, here we go again. Uh, let's look at just uh, the first verse here. Rather than reading the whole passage, I'll be referencing just four verses in particular. Uh, maybe a bit more than that, but let's start just with verse 1. Then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brothers, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and set its doors. They consecrated it as far as the Tower of the Hundred, as far as the Tower of Henanel. Let's pray, and then we will begin. Father, we do come to you one more time in prayer and ask that you will bless this time, bless the opening of your word. I pray that you would speak to us by your spirit and that you would encourage us once again in Christ. This we ask in his name. Amen. My outline for this passage is pretty simple. It is guided by three words, consecrated, dedicated, and then I couldn't decide between renovated or recreated. Recreated is a better theological term. I liked renovated for the way it rhymed a bit or a slant rhyme. And hopefully we'll be able to answer these questions. So how should we begin is our first question. And then what are we dedicated to? And what are we recreated for? My main charge to you this evening is simply this. First of all, to know the Lord's mission. And secondly, to pursue the joy of repairing in his service. First of all, consecrated. How should we begin? Uh, what is consecration? Actually, last summer we went through the kings of Israel in our preaching series, and I had the opportunity to preach on the king Hezekiah, and the subject of consecration came up then as well. And there we noted that this idea, this, this word comes up in a variety of contexts, and it essentially, at least in many contexts, comes down to cleaning, setting apart by prayer, preparing for worship, preparing for temple worship. Uh, at the core of the idea, however, is this setting apart, setting aside for a holy use, even a dedication as we see later on in chapter 12 of Nehemiah. Well, we have uh, things like Swiss Army knives. The, uh, the smartphones of today are our digital Swiss Army knives. It's the do-everything device. And I found over time that I really like devices that are dedicated to one purpose, like grills. A grill grills. And that you can get used to. I have a hard time getting used to things that have multiple purposes. An old mechanical race car is built for one purpose, going fast. Um, it's not a massage and communication center. It's got one use, driving. Here, in our texts, the priest sets aside something actually very common, something like a city gate, a wall. In this case, a sheep gate. And a gate has a particular purpose, a particular use, to allow something through the wall. In this case, the wall and the gate are consecrated to the Lord's service. A couple things to note. First of all, this consecration, this setting apart, happens amid naysayers. As we learn here in, uh, we learned in chapter 2 when we looked there last week, there will be naysayers. Or as Kevin preached one time, I think the title of his sermon is, Haters Gonna Hate. There will be naysayers. There will be haters. There will be those who mock 
decisions or progress or the plan that you have laid out, either by subtle hints or by direct confrontation. Here we have jeering back in chapter 2. The church in America has enjoyed a relative a respect, but as things change, we perhaps should get used to a bit more jeering, especially when it comes to the Lord's work. Now, surrounding this passage, this chapter 3, uh, are, is an interesting uh, bookend, actually a couple bookends. First of all, we have the bookends of the jeering. You have persecution at the end of chapter 2, and it picks up again in chapter 4. But there's one very interesting one that will come up now and at the end uh, of this passage, and that is the sheep gate. Um, chapter 3, verse 1, and in verse 32. As a literary device, these bookends are effective. But just for now, notice that the people rose up amid the jeering, amid the naysayers. They had not even quite started yet, and the jeering had come. Even so, in the midst of that, they set their work apart for the Lord's use, trusting in His blessing. I think sometimes we are tempted to sort of wait until we have consensus, wait until everything is just neat and perfect and just right before we begin working for the Lord. Now, gathering wisdom is a great principle of the Scriptures, but sometimes we just default to licking our fingers and sticking our hands in the air and seeing which way the wind blows before we end up committing. And I wonder if we will be okay with calling out the fact that certain movies, certain activities take the Lord's name in vain. Will you? Will you? Well, you're not. Okay, neither am I. Oh, you are. Okay, I'm with you. Let's call that out. Gathering wisdom when dealing with sticky wickets, that's wise. Gathering consensus before acting or standing on a principle, well, that's weak. Nehemiah presented the task and the reasons that they should build amid naysayers, amid jeering, and they did it. They started amid all this. In fact, they also started amid rubble. Um, I wonder sometimes if we can get started amid a mess. To reference another song, Tom Petty sings, the waiting is the hardest part. For me, the starting is the hardest part. I like to move my pencil holder around several times before I get started. I shove it around my desk and think, okay, now I can begin. And I like to have things sort of neat and it can delay the work. Do you wait until others have spoken before you toss your hat into the ring? Do you wait for the ministry to have just the right fervor before you can say, yes, I want to be a part of that? Do you like to know it will succeed before you give it your name or your blessing. Not only is that bad leadership, it makes you a follower rather than someone who understands your calling. I wonder if we can pick up the pieces as they began to do amidst the rubble, amidst the jeering, amidst the naysaying. What if the virus lasts longer than we all hope? Will we begin the Lord's work? Will we continue the Lord's work with prayer even if the financial markets fail. Amid the rubble, will we say, yes, we will consecrate, we will set apart our time and our labors and our hopes for the Lord? Can we not continue? Can we not begin to serve our King even in the midst of rubble and naysayers? Will we prayerfully set a marriage apart that has come upon a rocky time or rubble? Or do we wait until someone, the other party, shows enough contrition before we begin the work? Of course, uh, Nehemiah saw that uh, there was enough to begin. He did his homework. He, he sought things out. He took a midnight ride. He did his homework. But waiting for just the right set of circumstances will cause infinite waiting. So far, we've seen that we need a prayerful start, a consecration amidst the jeering, amidst the rubble, and even now when the odds were stacked against them. Now, overall, Nehemiah is a success story. 
And yet, before Nehemiah even had the king's blessing, before he had his timbers, before he had his letters of recommendation, his heart had already been set on the work. You'll see that in chapter 2. Further, even Nehemiah knew that he had to keep what he had in his heart quiet for a time as he assessed the situation. Now, this was smart because this was not going to be easy. He was working against the visible odds. Everything was in disarray, but he was not counting on the odds. He had the king's letters. He had the timbers coming, but ultimately, the Lord had put this in his heart, and he was counting on the blessing of the Lord. The progression was this. The Lord put this in his heart, he did the legwork, and then he acted in confidence on the blessing of the Lord. And when the jeering came, once again to reference the chapter prior, he responded with, the God of heaven will make us prosper, and we his servants will arise and build. It's fascinating that he did not say to Sanballat, we have letters, we have timbers. In fact, Sanballat knew all that, and he was angry about it. Will we, with prayer, set apart our work with confidence in Christ? As Paul said, yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Our confidence is not based on the odds or apparent outcomes. If your confidence is in good financial markets, less disease, less death, fewer tragedies, you will be sorely disappointed. Rather, we know that the Lord uses all these things for our good and His glory. A virus, as we learned this morning, does not take the Lord off guard. Our confidence is that the Lord will accomplish His great plan. He will set apart a people and redeem a people for Himself. What will you consecrate? What sort of things might we consecrate? We do a similar thing, although it symbolizes much more in baptism. We set apart ministries or marriages or visions for a church, a worship service we set apart with prayer week by week. Our choir is set up. We, we don't learn show tunes. It would be fun to learn a show tune, but we learn sacred tunes set apart for the worship of the Lord. And also, it's not just perhaps spiritual things which are appropriate. These priests set apart something pretty mundane, a gate. What about buildings and instruments and ground and tools? Now, all this is fine, but we also want to keep the big picture of Nehemiah in mind. Nehemiah was about the business of making a home for a covenant people. And so many things are good to set apart, but especially as they relate to the gathering and the building up of a people, the church. And so our first question is answered by simply saying this, amid jeering, amid rubble against the odds, we set apart things, work, people, ministries, with prayer and confidence, not in the odds, but in the Lord's plan to build and preserve a people. And that brings us now to the second main point, dedicated. Consecrated, then dedicated. And as a subtitle, I have this, follow your leaders and don't follow your leaders. In our culture, we have our tribes, our people, we have our groups, we have uh, uh, our running communities, and these things are often very good, reading clubs or acting troops, and they can often serve even as extended families. We also have leaders that we can trust, and folks like R.C. Sproul or Joni Erickson Tata, we've looked to them for leadership and wisdom and inspiration for years. On the other hand, we can become perhaps a little fanatical. Think of cults or our political landscape, medical choices, lifestyle choices. We have a tendency to 
to jump on bandwagons and follow individual leaders, sometimes even with blind allegiance. However, we find here, and we're going to look at a couple more passages now, we find here there are times to follow our leaders and there are times to ignore them. Thankfully, we don't have to be left guessing as to when to do that. Perhaps not every detail is answered here. In fact, it isn't. But we do have a rule of thumb, or better, a rule of revelation. Now, it's not wise, I don't think, to draw too many imperatives from a narrative passage such as this. So we have to be careful not to moralize. Um, historical narrative, however, can and does display, it's very good at displaying wisdom or courage, teaching a life lesson. And this shows two very simple ideas. Look at verse 9, chapter 3, verse 9. Next to them, Rephaiah, the son of Hur, ruler of half the district of Jerusalem, repaired. And as you read through this pat uh, passage, you'll find that so-and-so repaired, and so-and-so repaired, and so-and-so repaired. It's just the theme throughout the whole chapter. Verse 9, Rephaiah repaired. Verse 12, just to jump down there, next to him, Shalom, the son of Halohesh, ruler of half the district of Jerusalem, repaired, he and his daughters. These were important rulers getting out there, getting their, their hands dirty. Presumably, they'd heard Nehemiah's call. They'd seen his confidence in the Lord, and they got on board. And further, they didn't say, well, you, you little people, we're the rulers, you little people get out there and, and do the work. They were not, as Bob Dylan sings, one of the boss's hangers-on sometimes comes to call at times you least expect. Try to bully you, strong-arm you, inspire you with fear. It has the opposite effect. They were not like this. They weren't sitting back and shouting orders. They jumped in, and no doubt this encouraged the people around them. It's good to follow leaders who have done their homework, who get their hands dirty, and mainly who seek to serve the Lord, and they were doing this under the direction of of Nehemiah. But let's now back up to verse 5. And next to them the Tekoites repaired, but their nobles would not stoop to serve their Lord. And then jump over to verse 27, and we'll see this. After him, the Tekoites repaired another section opposite the great projecting tower as far as the wall of Ophel. Well, the Tekoite nobles would not stoop. They were stiff-necked. And compared with Nehemiah, these nobles were self-serving men who would not serve. Now, it's, hard, it's not hard to imagine them just scoffing at those who begin what looks like an impossible task. At the beginning of this project, they may have looked at each other and said, good grief, this is a bunch of hype. Why even begin? This is pie-in-the-sky foolishness. But that sort of thought is self-serving and self-gratifying. And so, yes, there are times we follow our leaders because we see them serving the Lord with humility, and there are times we do not follow the leaders, but we don't just choose willy-nilly. How does one do that? The answer is actually quite simple. It's huge, but it's simple. It's by being fully dedicated to the Lord's goals. That brings wisdom. Of course, this assumes that we know the Lord's goals and how he normally accomplishes those plans. He calls a people to himself through Jesus Christ. He spreads the gospel through his servants. He sanctifies us. He calls us to stoop and serve. The picture in this passage is actually pretty straightforward. Some leaders are worth following. Some are not. The way to decide is know the Lord's plan. Nehemiah published the plan that the Lord had put into his heart. And the only way to have wisdom in the details is to know the big picture. So, so far we have 
consecrated. We've learned that even amid the jeering and amid the rubble, amid humble beginnings against the odds, we set apart much of our lives, and especially that which relates to the building up of the church. And second, we're dedicated. There are times to follow, times to not follow, but being dedicated to the Word of God and His will or His law, His plan, His goal, this is paramount. Or as Kevin pointed out, even this morning, the fear of the Lord is clean in the beginning of wisdom as we're focused on His Word. The wisdom in the details follows. And then third, we find in this passage that a wall is being renovated, or we'll use the word recreated, made into something new for something new. At this point in Israelite history, it has already had a long history, and the, the people were built up, and then they were scattered, and now they're being brought back together again. And this is a pattern we see throughout the scriptures. Abraham and his descendants grow, and then they go into slavery, and then they are brought out as a new people into the promised land. The people unify around Saul, but then the kingdom splinters, and then they're reformed and strengthened under King David. Adam was created as the child of God, and then he, he sins and is exiled, and the new Adam remakes a people. Smaller pictures uh, actually follow a similar format, and we have one here in a wall. Now, this is a real history. It's also a picture. The wall is built, and then it's destroyed, and now it's being rebuilt into something new. But we should note that it's not exactly the way it was. In fact, as archaeologists study these passages, they have determined that actually, Nehemiah actually moved the wall on the east side of the city. And also this, this word repaired that you see over and over through this passage has a sense of being made firm, made solid. It's not really intended to communicate that they made a carbon copy of the prior wall. It's being repaired, remade. I was given some uh, depression glass, green depression glass, and I broke one of the plates. And so I got some really good glue and I put it together and it's now solid. But forever you will see, if you hold it just right, the crack that is there. It's solid, but you can see that sliver of a crack. It's like that for us as well. And so as many others have pointed out, as we look at our tele teleology, where, we'll, where we are headed, we are not headed back to Eden. We don't yearn for the good old days, or as Bruce Springsteen sings, and I hope when I get old I don't sit around thinking about it, but I probably will, yeah, just sitting back trying to recapture a little of the glory of, well, time slips away and leaves you with nothing, mister, but boring stories of glory days. Well, they'll pass you by, glory days, in the wink of a girl's eye, glory days, glory days. This is not our hope. The picture is not creation, fall, creation. Instead, it is creation, fall, recreation. Thankfully, we're not Humpty Dumpty either. We are new creations in Christ. What's interesting is that these new creations have their scars and all. The results of sin, the hard knocks or disease don't just disappear. Hard times come and they forever change us. Again, if you were hoping for easy street, you'll be sorely disappointed. After the fall, after being torn down, broken because of sin, we are then healed and remade and reformed in Christ. After all, what does the scripture say? The seed must die before it sprouts. As I sing in one of my songs, not quite as popular as Bruce Springsteen, but I sing, only the dead can rise. And so we are being recreated, made new, 
And finally, we see in this picture, in this chapter, that one part made holy, one part set apart, one part consecrated makes the whole thing holy. Christ redeems the whole man. Back to verse 1. They consecrated as far as the Tower of the Hundred, as far as the Tower of Hanel, but just before that, and they built the Sheep Gate. Consecration is not mentioned again in this chapter or even in the building project, and yet from gate to gate the construction continues. The chapter follows the entirety of the wall. It comes full circle. And then remember the bookends I mentioned at the beginning of this sermon. In verse 32, we find once again, jump there, and between the upper chamber and the corner of the sheep gate, the goldsmiths and the merchants repaired. In verse 32, we find that the priests work and then the goldsmiths and the merchants work meet. The whole enterprise is there consecrated. Likewise, Christ work extends to our account and the whole enterprise, that is the church, is set apart for the Lord. I suppose that we should be careful about making too much of all the little pictures we find in the Bible, and yet it should not surprise us that this begins and ends at the Sheep Gate. Matthew Henry suggests that at this gate they solemnly committed their city and the walls of it to the divine protection. It was through this gate that the sheep were led, the lambs were led to the sacrificial slaughter. Further, it should not surprise us that it not only began there, like I just said, but it ends there in verse 32. Our redemption begins with the Lamb of God, and it ends with the Lamb of God, the Alpha and the Omega. And during this construction project, some do a little, some do a more, more and some, like the, the overachieving Tekoites, do a lot. But all their work is now set apart, and then we find in chapter 12 of Nehemiah, is dedicated to the Lord. So it is when Christ recreates us. He does not redeem just part of us. He doesn't just save our intellects. He redeems the whole man for his glory and his service with our physical hands. He redeems his people. Nehemiah means Yahweh has comforted. And yes, Christ is our sheep gate. And through his sacrifice and his work, we, in fact, his church, are set apart. We are comforted. My comfort in life and death is that I am not my own, but belong both body and soul to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, consecrated, dedicated to His Word, and recreated for His work. I want us to know the Lord's mission and then pursue that joy of repairing. And so I simply ask in closing, what stone can you stick into the wall? How will you build up God's people? What will you set apart? What will you prayerfully bring before the Lord? And let me just add one thing. If you are older, there's no time like now to begin. As I read through this passage, I thought of the parable of the talents. Some started at the end of the day. Some did little work. Some did lots of work. And yet, their work was accepted. You don't have to be overachieving to coites. What part of the wall are you building? Can you move just one stone? Can you encourage one person or have one gospel conversation? Because you have known the Lamb of God who has come to take away the sins of the world. Let's pray. Father, we come to you once again and ask that you would bless your word, sweep away the chaff, and cause your word to prick our hearts and to encourage us into your service. And at all times, show us Christ in it, we pray. Amen.